It's time for a holiday. Time to get out of the city, away from the daily grind. With the rise of train travel came a new art of living, vacationing. All aboard. St. Petersburg, the Côte d'Azur, the Riviera. The names alone conjure up images of luxury and extravagance. Every year, thousands of pleasure-seeking tourists inundate these leisure capitals, where relaxing is elevated to the rank of art. Many of these great seaside resorts earned their reputations in the mid-19th century, during the golden age of rail. Attracting as they did the wealthiest people in the world, they soon became the stuff of legend. Gentlemen, ladies, and debutantes were part of a new class of travelers for whom the word and the concept of vacationing were invented. Not only in Canada, but also in Europe and the United States, the railways played a large role in the rise of what is today a multi-billion dollar industry. The railways had opened up some of the world's great natural sights. Now all they needed was people to admire them. In 1860, Canada, then still a British colony, had more kilometers of train tracks per inhabitant than any other country in the world. These endless strips of iron snaked through mountains, curved around lakes and ran along rivers, penetrating the country's interior as no other mode of transportation had done. The railway soon realized the enormous opportunity this presented. The link between railways and tourism is almost accidental. The railway's primary role was to bring you from point A to point B, usually two cities. That was its economic reason for being, and to tap the region's resources. But as it happens, the railways passed through some really beautiful areas, unique spots that had been inaccessible to the public. Since the railways went through those areas, and out of necessity, there were train stations every so often that created a new opportunity. All the Canadian railways, the Grand Trunk, the Intercolonial, the Canadian Pacific, wanted to make their routes profitable. And here was an untapped, potentially lucrative market right for the taking. By 1870, railway guides addressed to tourists appeared, suggesting itineraries and describing points of interest along the way. These publications aimed to sell the scenery, but even more so, the train itself. With so many high-quality railways, Canada quickly earned an enviable reputation as a tourist destination in both Europe and the United States. Before the Industrial Revolution, only the nobility and a few eccentrics could afford to be world travelers. But in the 19th century, when Romanticism swept Europe and land transportation improved, the situation changed. People wanted to discover new places and observe the natural environment. Every well-bred gentleman felt it was his duty to travel and escape the polluted cities. Bruce McNiven is the great-great-grandson of George Drummond, a shareholder of the Canadian Pacific Railway. His ancestors in Montreal quickly picked up on this new trend. 
Le doyen de McGill qui s'appelait Sir William Dawson, qui était... The dean of McGill, Sir William Dawson, who was a scientist, had a theory that the climate in Montreal was not at all healthy for people. There was too much humidity and the air was not good. So he found spots outside of Montreal, for example, on the St. Lawrence River, where he discovered a place called Kakuna, along with Métis, near Rivière du Loup. He told people that that was where you found the ideal summer climate. The Montrealers of Scottish origin formed vacation communities and built summer residences there. They traveled there by train or boat and spent the summer there with their families. Although leisure activities and summer excursions were popular, they remained the boon of a certain social class. In the British colony, only the bourgeoisie and a few notables had the time and money to get away from it all. How could a day laborer, factory worker, or store employee afford such frivolities? Their long work days and tough working conditions left them with no extra time or energy. Sunday was their only day off, and it was devoted to church services and family activities. In the 1890s, however, white-collar workers and some categories of union employees, such as railway workers, won the right to an eight-hour workday and Saturday afternoons off. A few hours of freedom. What would they do with this unexpected luxury? The picnic became one of the first examples of mass tourism. Once again, the railways helped make it possible. In conjunction with steamboats, the railways gave the middle classes a chance to spend a pleasant afternoon in the country. The railways, always intent on increasing passenger traffic, proposed a number of destinations. Of course, at first the lines were not very long, so they could not suggest, for example, that people who lived in Montreal travel all the way to the Rockies just for the pleasure of traveling. But they could propose short excursions, a weekend trip or a Sunday outing to what is now part of the suburbs, but back then was the destination. In the region of Montreal, for example, you could go to Chambly, which quickly became a popular spot for a one-day train outing. One activity in particular that the railways promoted and the public enjoyed was the picnic. It was an inexpensive family activity. Families would get together at a park. It became a tradition which lasted so long that picnicking has simply become part of everyday life. One popular picnic spot was located in the eastern townships, a few minutes from the city of Sherbrooke, on a small floating island in the middle of the St. Francois River. On warm Sunday afternoons in the early 1900s, throngs of city folks invaded the island, pompously called Coney Island, after the famous New York tourist site. To get to the island, picnickers took the Orford Mountain Railway, then crossed by boat. Once there, they could picnic, play games, and even stay over at a hotel. Unfortunately, this pleasant Sunday outing did not last long. A few years later, when Canadian paper was building a new dam for its paper mill, the company accidentally flooded the island. Coney Island disappeared forever under torrents of water. Nonetheless, this type of short excursion remained popular. It allowed the railways to turn a profit on the hundreds of small railway lines that crisscrossed the eastern part of the country. The regions of Montreal, Quebec City, the eastern townships, Rivière du Loup, and Ottawa were now accessible by train. American and British tourists in particular enjoyed these destinations with their pleasant landscapes and pastoral charm. The American Civil War, which had shaken the morale of wealthy Confederates, played a role in transforming the small Quebec village of North Hatley into one of the era's main holiday resorts. North Hatley, 
the jewel of the eastern townships. Luxurious summer homes nestled in the hills overlooking Lake Massawippi, reminding us of the rich Anglo-Saxon past of this romantic village. Summer 1886 in the bustling community of North Hatley. At the small train station across from the lake, passengers got off the Massawippi Valley Railway after a long trip. Among them was Henry Atkinson, the wealthy owner of Georgia Power in Atlanta. Atkinson had chartered private cars to accommodate his family, 20 black servants and 10 horses. They would spend three weeks in North Hatley. At the time, the village had over 700 summer residents, mostly Americans. The eastern townships were completely covered with railway lines. The railways multiplied their efforts to gain access to each village, each community. They had small mines and farm products, so there was an economic rationale for getting to those places. But in passing through, villages like North Hatley and Magog were discovered, as were Lake Memphis Magog and the other lakes. Before long, within 10 years or so, tourists arrived and the villages became popular. Companies started offering cruises on the lakes. People decided to build cottages there. There was a whole rapid sequence of events, and tourism developed spontaneously. Henry Atkinson was among the second wave of Americans to choose North Hatley. After the American Revolution of 1775, colonists who had remained loyal to the British crown received land on the shores of Lake Massawippi. Nearly a century later, the Civil War made North Hatley a summer destination for Atkinson and his fellow Southerners. These wealthy landowners, their pride wounded, decided not to take their holidays in the northern United States and traveled further to Canada. It is said that during the trip, the car's curtains were lowered when the train passed through enemy territory, the Yankee States. The Atkinson summer residence is now known as Hovey Manor, a luxury inn on the shores of Massawippi Lake. A great admirer of George Washington, Atkinson built his villa as a reproduction of the celebrated president's summer home. The new arrivals brought their southern lifestyle to North Hatley. Theirs was an aristocratic society with servants and butlers. Gentlemanly leisure activities filled their summer days. Indeed, the Atkinson's villa was famous for its private golf course, where the upper crust of American society would gather on July afternoons. They had the luxury of time. The pressures of the 20th century did not exist in the 19th century. If you were rich, you had the time to do whatever you wanted. People took three months vacation in the summertime. They went to Métis or Kakuna and enjoyed a very relaxing social life. In 1863, railway links opened up Lake Memphremagog, creating a tourist boom in this area, already a nature lover's paradise. Travelers took the Connecticut and Pasumpsic Railway to Newport on the American side of the lake, then boarded the steamship The Lady of the Lake and crossed to the Mountain House Hotel at the foot of Mount Owl's Head. With its 350 rooms, private vineyard, and opera performances, this hotel, built in 1845, acquired an international reputation. A little further west in Potton Township near the town of Sutton, today famous for its winter sports, vacationers patronized one of Canada's first health resorts, the Potton Spring. This small hotel built near the Orford Mountain Railway line gave tourists a spa experience. It has now been three days since I arrived in Canada. The hotel, while modest, is comfortable and well kept. I believe, my dear, that this spring is doing me good. That, at least, is what my husband believes, as he himself is feeling the benefit of this wild but invigorating environment. Affectionately, Mary. With these words, a wealthy English lady of Devonshire described her stay at the Potton Spring. 
Near the spa was a sulfurous thermal spring, which filled the air with a nauseating odor, but to which medicinal properties were ascribed. People came here to drink the sulfurous water, swim, relax, and enjoy themselves while on vacation. We are now just in front of where the main entrance was. The hotel was right over there. The hotel was built in 1875, at the same time as the railway, which was just over there. The hotel was built by a Mr. Green. Another wing was added in 1912. There were rooms for 75 people at a cost of two dollars a day. People came from everywhere. We have documents showing that people came from Europe, the United States, and the Eastern Townships. The place had an international reputation. This was the point of departure for the famous Potten Springs. People had a choice between sitting comfortably in a horse-drawn carriage and following the road to the spring, or those who were more athletic could climb the steps, those concrete steps over there, and follow a trail through the forest. In the 1930s, the hotel was completely destroyed by a mysterious fire and never rebuilt. By the late 19th century, vacationing had become a way of life among the English elite, which by now included the rail bourgeoisie. It was customary for Montreal's upper-class families, like that of George Drummond, to take the train to escape the city. Sir George Drummond was in the habit of renting a railway car. It was possible to rent a private car from Canadian Pacific, attach it to the train, and travel that way. So he was in the habit of taking the train. But if he was with a large group or with his family, he would rent a private railway car. The wealthy families would take the intercolonial railway line and set off for the riverside regions of the St. Lawrence River. Most of them stopped in Kakuna. The railway tourist guides described Kakuna as the most fashionable seaside resort in the Dominion, even calling it Canada's Saratoga. Among the prominent Canadians who owned luxurious summer homes in the area were John Molson Sr., main shareholder of the first Canadian railway, Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier, and Sir Montague Allen, son of the wealthy Montreal shipowner Hugh Allen. They were comfortable villas with verandas all around, where the aristocracy could unwind. The art of casual but stylish living was summarized by the expression, absence of routine and etiquette. The train, with its numerous links to the American networks, could carry tourists far beyond the city limits into hitherto unexplored territory. Vacationers could hunt in forests abounding in game and fish in well-stocked lakes and rivers. Each region had its own fish species, one a niche in Lac Saint-Jean, trout in Megantic Lake, and salmon in the Gaspé. Tourists loved these remote areas and created the first private clubs to take full advantage of them. Because Canada is by definition originally an Anglo-Saxon country, the majority of tourists were Anglo-Saxon, either British from England or Scotland, or American. The two groups were approached differently by the CPR, which was the first to really develop the tourist industry in order to increase traffic on its lines, not just through immigration. Many British tourists would come to Canada to visit their empire, it wasn't too difficult to get them to come here. It was enough to offer interesting resorts and to talk up the country. Tourists from the eastern United States, who came from the urban centers in New England, were also fairly easy to reach because they knew something of the tourist attractions available in their region, which was near Canada. On the other hand, the Canadian West and the American West were less developed and required a different tactic. The CPR understood that if it wanted to increase the tourist traffic of Americans from the West, 
it needed connection. Today we often talk about the connection problems between airlines. Back then, the railways realized that to attract visitors to Canada, they needed easy connections between the American railway lines and the Canadian lines, in addition, of course, to the tourist attractions. Another remote region that profited from this infatuation with unusual tourist destinations was Charlevoix. The area today recognized by UNESCO as a World Biosphere Reserve gained its reputation from the enthusiasm of American visitors. In the second half of the 19th century, Charlevoix became Canada's most renowned resort area. Gracing the spectacular landscape was the posh Manoir Richelieu, a landmark in the region. Owned in 1899 by the Richelieu and Navigation Company, it was acquired by the Canadian Pacific 100 years later. More than any other railway, it was the Canadian Pacific that elevated tourism and train travel to the level of art. In 1885, the railway had conquered the Rockies. Now it was time for tourists to take on those magnificent mountains. One of the protected sites of New Brunswick is the renowned Minister's Island, located in Chancook, near the historic resort town of St. Andrews, formerly St. Andrews by the Sea. In this enchanting setting, William Cornelius Van Horn, general manager of the Canadian Pacific Railway, had a summer residence built around 1890. He named it Covenhoven. At high tide, the estate is only accessible by boat. Smitten by the beauty of Passamaquoddy Bay, Van Horn acquired a large part of the island, where friends and fellow CP directors built summer getaways of their own. At the time, Van Horn was the most respected man in the railway industry. He had succeeded in building a transcontinental railway in record time. This feat opened up all of Canada to the rest of the world. Under the influence of this cultivated, energetic man, Canadian railway tourism would experience an unprecedented boom. Van Horn had imposed his powerful will and made the mountains yield. His next challenge was to bring as many travelers as possible to admire his accomplishment. Van Horn would quickly realize that if he wanted to recuperate his costs, because he had just finished building the Transcontinental in 1885, opening Canada to colonization starting in 1886, the first step was to work on colonizing the land and bringing in immigrants so as to pay off the construction costs. But tourism would prove to be a phenomenon that was just as profitable. It was not as profitable as immigration over the years, because there were fewer tourists than there were immigrants, and they spent less money because they did not come to settle. But still, it was a very lucrative activity that grew in popularity. Van Horn understood that he had to offer high-quality attractions in his famous saying, since we can't export the scenery, we'll have to import the tourists. Wanting the entire travel experience to be first class, Van Horn had more than 60 luxury hotels built along the railway line. The Stephen House in Field, B.C., the Empress in Victoria, the Chateau Frontenac in Quebec City, the Vancouver Hotel, each more breathtaking than the one before. The locations of these palaces were carefully chosen to give visitors the most beautiful viewpoints, nature on a silver platter, so to speak. 
Ben Horn was able to use tourism to increase his revenues. He understood the need to offer an integrated service. The CPR took tourists under its wing from the moment they arrived and encouraged them to use all the products it offered, such as reduced rates and easy payment terms. But especially it took care of its customers, giving them a feeling of security. This created a formula that tour guides around the world still use today when they take on a tourist group. People buy their tickets at a travel agency, a group is organized and from there everything is taken care of. It's the same basic premise as what the CPR did at the time. They cleared the way and figured out how to make travel easy for people. Today, the Rocky Mountain region is the heart of Western Canada's tourist industry. It owes much of its reputation and popularity to the railways. More than anyone else, Van Horn reigned over the Rockies. This gave him a considerable advantage and allowed him to develop a new tourist product, outdoor activities. In 1883, in the Bull Valley, now Banff, Alberta, CPR employees discovered a hot spring that gushed out of a cave. Van Horn immediately saw a gold mine in the hot spring and seized on the opportunity it presented. Five years later, he built the Banff Springs Hotel. It was an immediate success. All the railways wanted in on the windfall. All agreed that the hot spring should be protected. Animated discussions and long negotiations resulted in the creation of Canada's first national park, the Banff National Park. At the CPR suggestion, two other parks were formed, Glacier National Park on the Alberta border and Yoho National Park in British Columbia. In 1907, Jasper National Park came into being a joint effort between the CPR and the Grand Trunk Pacific, then busily building a line of its own in the west. The Rocky Mountains harbor famous glaciers like the Columbia Icefield. In the eyes of American and British tourists, the Canadian Rockies were the very incarnation of the North American wilderness, dwarfing humankind with their phenomenal scale. This image of nature is unbounded and generous, brought a new category of tourists to the CP trains and hotels. Just as the regulars at Jasper and Banff do today, hikers and mountain climbers began getting together at the foot of these huge mountains. For these new tourists, the railways willingly transformed the area into no less than the Canadian Alps. People would come to the Rockies to go rock climbing, and that was a new sport for North Americans. They had only discovered skiing in the early 20th century, whereas Europeans had known it long before. So why not bring in some Swiss guides who already knew all about rock climbing? That was part of the same notion of offering a feeling of security by taking care of the tourists. In 1899, the first two Swiss guides arrived, soon followed by others, including their brothers. Some would later return to Switzerland, while others would remain in Canada for the rest of their lives. The last one, incidentally, died in 1981 at the age of 96, so they lived long lives. Offering this kind of quality supervision was part of the service. On July 21st, 1900, artist and naturalist Mary Walcott of Philadelphia prepared to climb the Rocky Mountains. She was the first female mountaineer to attempt to scale such a large mountain. Mary Walcott and her wealthy family maintained excellent relations with the CPR directors. In fact, the CPR gave them complimentary train tickets and hotel rooms. In return, Mary praised the area's features in a magazine article entitled The Glaciers of the Canadian Rockies and Selkirks. In the 1920s, the Rockies would win the heart of another American woman, Lillian Guest, who wrote thrilling accounts of her photographic expeditions in the majestic Canadian mountains. 
Tourist traffic had become a great moneymaker for all the railways. Following the example of the Canadian Pacific, they outdid themselves with feats of imagination and originality to court this clientele. They had many assets to work with, comfortable trains, spectacular scenery, and a reputable hotel network. But how could they communicate all that to potential tourists here in Canada and beyond the country's borders? The answer was advertising. The railways, particularly the CPR, became masters of promotion and publicity. In the process, they would contribute to the development of a key 20th century industry, advertising. According to today's marketing specialists, people in large cities are exposed to around 3,000 different advertisements every day. We can't escape advertising. It's part of the urban landscape. This form of communication has become increasingly important during the 20th century, but it made a remarkable debut with the railways. The golden era of rail gave rise to one of the richest forms of advertising on an artistic level, the railway poster. The railways developed advertising departments, which today would probably be called public relations departments. Their aim was to promote the company's products, either through posters, which were displayed in strategic locations to promote tourism, or through specific events and expositions. In the late 19th century, it was common for the railways to publish travel accounts in the local newspapers describing the trips taken by well-known personalities at their invitation. While effective, this advertising strategy would never match the potency and appeal of the color posters and pamphlets produced by the railways, which extravagantly praised the comfort of the trains and splendid landscapes. The railways were the first to use the new technique of the poster, and in particular color lithography, to encourage people to travel. This conjunction between the development of color lithography and the creation of advertising departments at the railways was a fortunate event. It led to the production of a tremendous number of posters, although what is curious is that only a few remain. They were ephemeral products. Very few of the poster artists are known. The posters were made by the advertising department. Nonetheless, a few names come to mind, such as Jules Chéret, who was known as the father of posters, or rather the father of modern lithography. Among his works were the very first color railway posters. Of course, before that there were older forms of posters, but Chéret was the early master of color landscape lithography. One of his designs was meant to encourage people to visit Chamonix in the Alps. Before long, the CPR would take up this new art form, as would the CNR. They began to produce some very beautiful posters. The train station walls were liberally splashed with examples of this new form of advertising. The exuberance of color and form was matched only by the fierce competition between the railway companies. Under Van Horn's influence, railway poster design would experience a boom. Van Horn was an artist himself, a great painter, and a man of multiple talents. In fact, if he hadn't been director of a railway, he would probably have been director of a big advertising company. That would have been his style. Van Horn liked using slogans in his speech, some of which were well chosen, others less so. The most well known is, since we can't export the scenery, we will have to import the tourists. But at the same time, many of these slogans were quite terse, almost curious. For example, quality for the prince. Of course, the railway had accommodated the Prince of Wales on its train, so he wanted to promote his lines by speaking of quality for the prince. However, people found the slogan a little odd. 
25 years later, a person who had become a well-known publicist approached one of the directors of the CP and said, uh, your slogans back then were really quite weak, even though they were the first slogans launched by Mr. Van Horn. And the CP director replied, uh, since you remember them 25 years later, they weren't so bad after all. Van Horn called upon some of the most famous artists of the time to design his posters. Wanting to convey the idea that the CPR trains pass through landscapes of unsurpassed beauty, he even suggested that the artists alter reality to make it seem more compelling. In a letter addressed to one of his poster artists, he advocated enlarging Mount Stephen to create even more impact. I find, he wrote, that the mountain is not majestic enough. I don't believe anyone who travels will have in their possession an image able to prove that there was exaggeration on our part. If that was not enough, he would retouch the drawings himself, disregarding the rules of artistic integrity. Nonetheless, the poster medium had a few stars of its own. One of the artists most in demand at the time was Hal Ross Perigard. His posters were true works of art. The Perigard style was distinguished, among other things, by the prominence given to women. Poster designers saw women as a symbol of refinement and an appropriate way to promote the beauty of the landscapes, which themselves occupied only a small part of the poster. Women also symbolized the family and security and served to communicate the idea that the train, although it was a relatively new technology, was a safe means of transportation. The railways also discovered that this form of advertising was a good way to promote immigration and attract colonists to the new territories served by the train. The posters were displayed in train stations and the immigration offices the railways opened in Europe and the United States. The illustrations in these advertisements portrayed Canada as an idyllic land of lush crops and happy farmers. During the First World War, the railways, particularly the CPR, concentrated their efforts on channeling tourist traffic to places where they owned hotels. Around this time, the CPR launched a new slogan, the Canadian Pacific, largest travel agency in the world. This era was the heyday of the railway poster. With the introduction of photography, the poster lost its most appealing feature, its artistic side. Of course, photography is an art of itself, but it's not the same thing. The photographs used in posters were black and white. It was not until later that color photos appeared. By then it was too late. The rupture had occurred. When the poster first left behind color lithography and replaced it with photography, the photographs were in black and white. By the time color was introduced in the 1950s, it was already too late. The poster had denigrated and lost its impact. Nonetheless, the artistic posters and seductive advertising slogans promoting the Canadian railways proved to be effective sales tools. People from all over crowded onto trains to discover the country that had elicited such praise. Canada was about to embark upon the great era of luxury train travel. What better setting for a love story? As we enter the 21st century, this venerable old steam locomotive is still going strong in British Columbia. Passengers who climb aboard this historic train can relive the golden era of train travel. Not only that, but this particular locomotive, the Hudson, has a glorious past. In 1939, the eyes of the entire country were on the Hudson. The handsome locomotive was given the honor of pulling the royal train carrying some very special visitors, King George VI and his wife, Queen Elizabeth. The royal couple were traveling across Canada as part of their visit to the former colony. 
All during the trip from Quebec to Vancouver, the King praised the train for its comfort and the performance of its locomotive. The King and his wife were so impressed with the locomotive and its performance that they gave the CP the right to designate it the Royal Hudson. The locomotive that had pulled their train was the 2850. It is now in Montreal at the Museum in Delson Saint Constant. The 2860, which is ours, is the only one still in operation. Despite its royal title, the appearance of diesel engines and the popularity of cars forced the Royal Hudson into retirement. Some years later, thanks to the efforts of a few railway enthusiasts, the valiant locomotive was given a new lease on life. The Royal Hudson was restored and returned to service in 1975 by a group of volunteer railway enthusiasts. BC Rail was the railway chosen to operate the locomotive. What a fabulous era the Royal Hudson calls to mind. It conjures up images of the great period of steam engines, when luxury train travel was considered the height of fashion. Another stunning locomotive that turned heads in the early 1900s was the Sioux Spokane, a marvel of craftsmanship and design that was the ultimate luxury train. One luxury train that comes to mind is the Sioux Spokane, which was almost as luxurious as the Orient Express. It had an aura of mystery and it traveled through some very beautiful sights. It was not designed to carry people from point A to point B, but to offer a cruise experience. Sioux Spokane is a Canadian controlled train. It was controlled, the company was a joint Canadian international service. Uh, controlled by Canadian Pacific, who owned the or controlled the Sioux Line in the United States. Uh, the Sioux Line was the builder of most of the train. Some of the cars were owned directly by Canadian Pacific, but all of them together were controlled by Canadian Pacific and developed into an international service. As often happened during the great era of rail, the Sioux Spokane was the scene of a charming love story. In the summer of 1907, Christine Johnson of Minneapolis, Minnesota, was returning from a trip to Sweden, her native country. On the ship was Andrew Rosen, a Canadian Pacific foreman who had emigrated to Canada in 1895. Andrew and Christine met on the Lusitania in 1907 on probably its third voyage. It was launched in that year, it was the fastest largest and most luxurious liner yet put into service on the highly competitive Atlantic route from Britain to New York. Um, as I was saying, they met on the Lusitania, fell in love, became engaged. Andrew returned to his uh, workplace, which was uh, Jaffrey, which is about 35 miles, 50 kilometers southeast of Cranbrook, very early in the development of that area. He was also employed by the Canadian Pacific at the time uh, involved with uh, uh, Thai construction and uh, clearing land for the, for the railway. So he made arrangements to send uh, tickets to Christine, who resided in Minneapolis. And she had gone home originally to visit her family in Sweden, and that's how they met coming back on the Lusitania. So the only way for her to get from Minneapolis through Jaffrey, through Cranbrook to Spokane, where they were married, was on the Sioux Spokane Train Deluxe. They were married on December 5th in Spokane and returned to Cranbrook aboard the fabulous Sioux Spokane. They honeymooned in the chic Cranbrook Hotel, specially built for the wealthy clientele of the railways. They settled in Jaffray, British Columbia, where they had three children and lived happily ever after. It was their daughter, Olga Bakken, who told the Canadian Museum of Rail Travel in Cranbrook this romantic story about her parents. Christine's daughter, Olga, of course, came up to, to see us and see this car because she remembers her mother telling her about this beautiful train that she traveled on. And it could only have been the Sioux Spokane Train Deluxe because there were no other trains of this type with this type of accommodation. She also apparently had, coming out, a private room 
and of course, uh, coming back from Spokane, they would have had a private room. The only car on the Sioux Spokane with that would be the Curzon class. The Curzon are one of its five sisters, uh, including the car Cranbrook, which was one of the set of six cars. Uh, Cranbrook and its sister cars have long disappeared. In 1930, the train, now beginning to show its age, became a victim of the Great Depression. It was taken off the tracks and left in a state of neglect. Only two cars, the Curzon and one sleeping car, escaped demolition. This car was located in the state of Wisconsin, in a town near Fond du Lac called Pipe, on the shore of the lake. It was a country cottage uh, on the lake since the early 1930s, so a little over 60 years it remained there. And we brought it back on a flat car on the railway and then brought it onto the site, put new wheels and understructure under it, and brought the electricity and the environmental controls and heating and lighting into it, uh, so the public can see these beautiful works of art. In recent years, tourists seem to be rediscovering the pleasures of train travel. Perhaps it's the beginning of a whole new love story.